Bye. We are back, folks. It's the Alex Jones Show. I am Jason Burma sitting in. And let's not forget that President Barack Obama has already stated that he has built a cybersecurity office, a new intelligence service, okay? Another bureaucracy. Homeland Security, not enough. You know, the NSA wasn't enough before that. The CIA, the FBI, all these other agencies, not enough. We need a cybersecurity czar. And they brought this word back into the language as though it's commonplace and we should be accepting it. Folks, we shouldn't be accepting czars. We have elected officials for a reason. We like things like oversight. We like to stop corruption and bring people up on charges when they do something wrong. Czar is just like, I'm omnipresent, I have all the power, I do what I want. And that's why they've created the cybersecurity office and a cybersecurity czar. Uh, let me read a little bit more of this article here. The new version would allow the president to declare a cybersecurity emergency relating to non-governmental computer networks and do what's necessary to respond to a threat. Other sections of the proposal include a federal clarification or certification program for cybersecurity professionals and a requirement that certain computer systems and networks in the private sector be managed by people who have been awarded that license. In other words, we need government snoops on all privatized networks with hands-on experience. We can't afford to have somebody miles and miles away trying to shut down a server. We need somebody on site. I think the redraft, while improved, remains troubling due to its vagueness, said Larry Clinton, president of the Internet Security Alliance, which counts representatives of Verizon, uh, Verisign, Nordle, and Carnegie Mellon University on its board. It is unclear what authority Senator, Senator Rockefeller thinks is necessary over the private sector. Unless this is clarified, we cannot properly analyze, let alone support the bill. No, you can properly analyze this bill. It's garbage. It's crap. It's control. That's what this bill is about. It's about the elimination of free speech on the Internet entirely. It will allow them to shut down InfoWars. It will allow them to shut down any article that they don't see fit. If they don't like what Larry Flint is saying over at the Huffington Post and it's getting too much traction, nix it. Okay? They feel very, very threatened. You know, I used the point yesterday of how Michael Moore had his trailer on from August 20th to the 26th and only received 30,000 views. Well, I went to the Alexa ratings yesterday, and michaelmoore.com is like 44 or 45,000, okay? Compare that to infowars.com. We're below 4,000. We are 11 times more popular than the most popular documentary filmmaker in the world. What does that say? That says that they have to start regulating us before we go completely supernova. And that's what these bills are about. All right, let's shift the gears. Let's get into this top 400 list. This is a Wall Street Journal uh, article, by the way. Banks on sick list top 400. Okay, the banking industry continues to deteriorate while federal regulators are adding 111 lenders to their list of endangered banks in the latest quarter. Even the economy shows signs of stabilizing. That's a total lie. They're, they constantly are saying, oh, the, the economy's stabilizing, growth is starting to occur. No, it's not, folks. In fact, I've got another article here. Whirlpool about to fire eleven or uh, 1,100 people, and that's nothing. Whirlpool, just another company feeling the crunch. They're out of here. 1,100 more jobs out of here. The post office is firing and buying out 30 thousand of its employees meanwhile they are converting to a global currency for international shipping say it with me they are converting to a global currency the sdr unit special drawing rights unit this is the currency of the current incarnation of the new world order this is what they're promoting this is what they're pushing Data released Thursday painted a gloomy, gloomy picture of the state of banking. The government fund that protects consumer deposits fell to its lowest level since 1993. Uh, the continuing lows, which come despite trillions of dollars in government rescue financing and rebounding stock market, raise questions about how quickly the economy can revive. Well, at least they're being honest about the trillions. They're not going to tell you $24 trillion, which we, 20, I think it was 23.7 Two months ago in Bloomberg now, almost two months ago, they're, they're reporting 23.7 trill, dog. 23.7 trill they've gutted us for. And all that's going to happen is all these smaller banks, the ones that are actually semi-honest, are going to be put out of business as they consolidate power 
and they just take it to the house. Let me tell you something. Merrill Lynch ain't going under. Bank of America ain't going under. Chase Manhattan ain't going under. The CIO, the CEOs are not facing hardships. No, they're out on a beach somewhere laughing it up, patting each other on the, on the back. <laughs> Another martini, you bet. You bet. I mean, they are drinking alcoholic fruity beverages while laughing at you as their bank account just goes through the roof. Uh, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corp. said it has 416 banks on its problem list at the end of June, equivalent to about 5% of the nation's bank, up from 305 at the end of March and 117 at the end of June 2008. Problem banks had a combined $299.8 billion of assets at the end of June, compared to $78.3 billion a year ago. Landing on the FDIC's problem list means a bank is at a high risk of insolvency. State and federal regulators have already shut 81 banks this year. And again, we reported it this week, one of the, lar the second largest bank to go under was right here in Texas. And they're just out of here. Gone. Done. So you're just going to continue to see this again and again and again. And I don't know if they're going to declare a bank holiday. I don't know what happens if the FDIC goes under. But I do know that they are moving towards a global system of currency. And this SDR unit, which they've loaned out to Mexico now, it, it's, it's what they loan out. They're not loaning out dollars. The dollar is dead. It's done. It's over with. Get a grip. Be an adult. Admit it to yourself. Admit you need a plan. Your dollars are... When Max Kaiser, uh, it must have been like four or five months ago, when he was using the toilet paper analogy, he was spot on. And how are we going to communicate with one another as this happens if they shut down the Internet? Let's not forget either, because a lot of people still think that, you know, they don't surveil everything we do on the Internet. Look, it came out in Hefting versus AT&T. Over 40 officials blew the whistle, Mark Klein being one of them that everything you do on your cell phone and on the Internet is tracked, traced, and databased by all the major companies, including AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, you name it. Jason, how does that work? It's very easy. Everything goes through a line, a physical line. Information goes over fiber optic cables, okay? So they just split the fiber optic cable. They send it into the secret room in a room full of servers. Everything is copied verbatim. It doesn't have any distinguishing what's allowed to be copied and what's not. And then it runs through software like Carnivore and Promise. Those are, those are old declassified pieces of software. God knows what they're using today. And they look for key words and key phrases and patterns. And everything you do is being categorized. And it's going to jump to another level as soon as Microsoft launches their Project Natal, where they literally put a face scanning voice recognition camera in your home. You are the controller. It's hooked up to the Internet all the time, unless you unplug your uh, Ethernet system, and most people won't be smart enough to do that. And this thing can recognize up to four people at once, okay? It recognizes your voice pattern. You can shop online with this thing. It's like the Jetsons. You go on to Amazon.com. It's looking at you as you're shopping through it. Your hand is the remote control. You can model clothes with this thing. This is the next level, and we are being acclimated to it on another level. We're, we are being trained to think that's okay to have in your house. Meanwhile, in the United Kingdom, they're saying that the worst of the worst, the worst parents are now going to have to be under 24-hour CCTV surveillance in their home. In their home. Their very own residence. And if you don't think that that's coming to the United States, it is. Everything that happens in the U.K. eventually gets here, and everything that happens here eventually gets to the U.K. We are the model. Meanwhile, we love China's slave state. We can't get enough of the way that they treat their workers, their one-child policies, and we move closer to that as they start to wear our blue jeans and slurp down our Coca-Cola. It is this motion towards a global society, towards one world, and that's what the elite continue to push. All right. I've harped on the banks, I've harped on the economy, I've harped on the cybersecurity. It's time to get into swine flu. Now, if you've been listening this week, I've been ranting and raving how you can't get higher than level six. Well, apparently, the WHO is announcing in, uh, in Spain that they are higher than level six. Weird, right? I'm holding an article out of the Costa News right now. Hospitals gear up for flu epidemic. And right here, this little excerpt, as each medical facility puts its protocols into action, the health authority continues to keep its 24-hour hotline, and the World Health Organization has raised its pandemic alert level to 6.2. 6.2? Wait a minute. You're not supposed to be above 6. This is about fear-mongering. 
This is about trying to get people even more overhyped about the situation. Oh, my God, 6.2. It's like them raising the terror threat level right before the elections. Remember, we were big conspiracy theorists when they started raising the terror threat level in 2004. And we said, look, there's no more of a threat for terrorism than there was yesterday or the week before or the month before. This is all politics. This is about fear-mongering to the American public because it didn't really matter that John Kerry won the election. That's right. John Kerry won the 2004 election, folks. I mean, count the ballots. But then he bowed down the next day after they rigged it. He didn't challenge it. He didn't say, hey, I want to see my votes over in Ohio. Hey, I want to see where they had diebold systems. He said, you know what? My skull and bones brother is going to make a great president for the next four years. I love him. My second cousin on one side, my eighth cousin on the other, George W. Bush, our savior.